All right. Uh, checking one, two, three, four. It looks like I'm good. Ed, if you'll uh, count to one, four. Two, one, two. Yeah, that's one, coming then, up. Uh, one, two, three, four. Perfect. Putting that PhD to use. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wonderful. All right, Ed, if you will uh, set the stage for us. Hello and welcome to Call of Discovery, the podcast where we invite you on a journey into the crucible for a weekly or fortnightly celebration of all things Keyforge, its community, and of course, the excitement of Discovery. And today we are delighted to be joined by a man that needs absolutely no introduction, Richard Garfield. Richard, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And of course, we're going to get diving straight into our topic of, of Keyforge and really everything Keyforge. So, Zach, do you want to take it away with the questions? Yes, uh, of course. Of course. So, uh, Richard, you've come up with a couple of games that have had uh, pretty good effects on, on gaming and, and how people enjoy themselves, especially with cards. And two of those, of course, are uh, Magic the Gathering and uh, Netrunner, a personal favorite of mine. And what mechanics that people might be familiar with in those games uh, did you want to evolve as you were working on? Uh, well, um, there's a th there's a lot I really like about customizable card games, uh, uh, trading card games, um, and uh, uh, but the mechanics of them uh, uh, feel like they're often limited by them being trading card games. Uh, the fact that you can optimize your deck uh, and that that's a big part of the game, which is a huge appeal to a lot of the players, um, it also uh, gets in, in the way of how it's played, I believe, for, uh, um, well, I, I would say for the casual player, but that's not quite true. Um, but certainly for the person who doesn't uh, doesn't want to build decks, uh, and uh, and and so and so really there was no mechanic that I didn't want to take from the trading card game uh, uh, type of game uh, to to reflect in in Keyforge. Uh, uh, I I just wanted to take the Keyforge concept and and explore what what was best for those mechanics uh, in that environment. Sure, sure. And uh, I know two of those mechanics that I think um, weren't really present in some of those earlier games that uh, I just have thought spent so much time thinking about the uniqueness of the decks, like you said, that creates kind of a new space to to play with a deck, but also the lack of traditional resource costs, uh, which, you know, Magic has in Mana and Netrunner had in, in credits, or um, I think they were bits yeah, in that's the, right. uh, the first iteration. Oh, they changed that? Yeah. I, I didn't even realize uh, that. Yeah, I, I thought bits was pretty cool. Oh, <laughs> they, they did. <laughs> yeah, they, they switched it to, to credits for, for I don't, I don't think I even realized that. I did uh, play the, 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 the new version, which uh, I did not have too much to do with other than sort of uh, a... Uh, uh, informal approval, uh, but uh, uh, but uh, yeah, um, I did I didn't remember that. Uh, yeah, uh, 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 that was certainly one of the things that was immediately clear is that we didn't need to have uh, any sort of costing because the cost was sort of built into the fact that it was part of your deck um, and uh, that you couldn't take it out. Uh, um, and uh, at the same time, uh, and and so when I began this, I wanted to. Uh, figure out what I could do with that freedom. And it turns out that, I mean, somebody else may come along later that uh, has better ideas with it, but, uh, but, uh, but I found that I wanted to keep the cards uh, reasonably balanced um, uh, and uh, I mean, more balanced than I expected going in. I mean, I expected to have, for instance, at, at first I expected to have cards that were actually disadvantages for you to have. Uh, that's uh, uh, where, where, yeah, this this card was just bad for you to have. In the current incarnation of the game, that doesn't even really make any sense without some extra rules. But uh, but there were many earlier incarnations where that could could have happened. But uh, uh, in the end, uh, uh, I, I 
I tried to keep it. I mean, probably not. Uh, uh, certainly uh, not as balanced as I would have a, as a trading card game, but uh, not orders of magnitude off either, which is what I was expecting. Absolutely. And I think that brings us neatly into into one thing that is very different about the unique deck model than that maybe wouldn't be possible in those other collectible tr- or trading card games. And um, that is that some cards in Keyforge are explicitly less useful versions of, of other cards. For instance, you know, Fear returns an enemy creature to hand, Lights Out returns two, and Nature's Cool gives you the choice of three. So what do you think is it behind Keyforge that really allows these cards to to exist in tandem where they wouldn't necessarily be able to do so in in a, in a, a constructive game? Well, uh, yeah, there, there are uh, a couple answers to that. Uh, the first is that is a natural uh, uh, outgrowth of not having a cost uh, necessary that we we can just have those, you know, those differences. Um and uh, um, it, it was really, it took a while for us to get, for, for me to get my head around uh, all the things that uh, the premise of Keyforge could bring to the table. Um, in Magic uh, and other trading card games, uh, I, I, I'm constantly unhappy when uh, there's a card which I like, but I realize that I've got to get rid of it because my deck just will work better without it. That's a, a, an unpleasant and unfun experience for me, especially when those cards are interesting. And that isn't part of Keyforge. If you've got the card, you're going to play it. It's just a matter of how much you can get out of it. And uh, that's not, uh, you know, I said that uh, that uh, there was something more casual about it. There is, but um, at the same time, you can play very, very seriously with a deck that's filled with really weird cards. Uh, it's just that, that in trading card games, that uh, uh, being good at it has gotten so conflated with putting together a good deck rather than playing well um, that, uh, that uh, um, it's not recognized. It's, it's, it's sort of thought that if you play with these cards, you're a bad player. But that, that's not necessarily true, and, and Keyforge gives you permission to do that. Um, to, to, uh, but the other angle on that is, is, that, uh, is that some of the, uh, these cards you mentioned uh, largely appear in different houses, and uh, um, and so th- that for me that's a, a completely different thing. Also, uh, uh, I'm I'm hesitant to make cards which dominate each other within the same house. Um, I, I did do that, uh, but but uh, uh, I did not do it much. And uh, um, and but uh, but when you've got a card in one house which is much better in another house. Um, that's okay uh, by me. Uh, that's analogous to uh, in Magic, uh, having direct damage be very effective in one color, but not as effective in another. Sure. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Like you said, um, using that card uh, doesn't, meant just, you know, using the weaker card doesn't necessarily mean you are a worse player in the other game. Perhaps you're trying to explore something, but like you said, it it might it might handicap your deck in a, a you know internet meta where uh, where people are trying to solve these these deck lists. Um, one other kind of overall mechanical thing about Keyforge <clears throat> it shares a, a rough similarity to Netrunner, but not many other games have done this. Most games uh, that have iterated on on Magic in their own way, uh, Hearthstone and a few others, uh, still stick with the you know take your opponent's life uh, down to zero. Um, was there a uh, what was your thought process going into Keyforge to make it a racing game instead of a um, uh, I take my opponent's life down to zero I grow my own resources up to a number? Oh, um, well, there, there there were versions of uh, Keyforge that were uh, take the opponent's life down, and uh, it wasn't until fairly late in the process that uh, that I decided to go with the current version. Um, and uh, to see, I mean, uh, 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 it's 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 pretty clear that they're they're very similar to one another. Uh, if you if you picture the opponent as having, uh, I guess, uh, three life points, and each time you uh, um, uh, build a key, you're subtracting one. You know, it's it's kind of a life take a life depleting game, and the uh, 
the earlier versions I had, which went along those lines, were kind of, you know, not not entirely dissimilar with that to that. Uh, uh, the big thing was I uh, made it so that the that the in in, in a game like Magic and, and Hearthstone, uh, creatures do a certain amount of damage to each other, and they do the same amount of damage to your opponent. And it was very very different in Keyforge in every version where they do a certain amount of damage to each other, but their effect on the opponent was sort of was was much different. Uh, and uh, um, in the in the end, uh, I, I decided I like to have the more uh, constructive feel to the game where you're building up something. Uh, 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 because that opened up, uh, uh, at least flavor-wise, for different mechanics, even though uh, logically it's not all that different. And uh, and and uh, I had a lot of players who responded positively to that. They liked the uh, feel of that, and so that's what I went with. It's definitely one of those things that gives Keyforge a, a, the character and flavor, and uh, one of the reasons why I think I think we we absolutely love it. And um, so, Richard, it's an oft touted fact that a game is played more on its first day of release than through the entirety of playtesting, which with a game like Keyforge must have been quite scary before its release. So, with the knowledge that you know, a game really does take on it a new life once it's released. What do you think has surprised you most about how people have played with and interacted with Keyforge since its release? There, uh, there, uh, there's been many things which uh, have surprised me, and I was really just uh, so uh, much looking forward to it being in the public because I was so curious as to how it would be played. And it was uh, actually a uh, um, I, I hated the fact that uh, pretty much the the first expansion uh, was designed before I had that information, uh, so had very limited uh, uh, ability to react to it. Um, and so, uh, one of the things was well, the, the, so one one of the things was uh, seeing uh, what people reacted negatively to. Uh, and what they reacted positively to, um, and uh, and and not everybody, of course, it's not a monolith. Not everybody re- uh, reacted the same way to everything, but but uh, but um, the decks uh, that, for instance, didn't have would have a particular uh, thing which would require another card in your deck, and I, you know, didn't put enough of those cards in the in the original algorithm. Uh, that uh, was largely disliked. Um, so, so, and, and there was one place where I just out, outright made a mistake. Uh, I think the sacrifice, uh, where you can mm. sacrifice a human. sacrificial altar. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that was just a mistake that, uh, that, that shouldn't have been that way. Um, but, uh, my usual standards were, were if you had like the bear flute or something like that, that you, that it just guarantees you have a single bear. Um, and, uh, um, and, uh, and and that's because I wanted to make as many possible decks as po- as many different decks as possible, and I didn't regard that as being any worse than um, you know just getting a card which didn't really work well, which you know, is part and parcel of Keyforge. You just try to get the most out of it, um, and and I, I kind of uh, uh, I loosened up on that a lot uh, um, after after it got released because uh, because I I I, I sort of understood where people were coming from with disliking that and uh and 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 uh, and it felt the, the decks felt cooler if they were a little more constructed in that in in those situations um uh, so the, uh, yeah i could go on, on on lots of different ways that i was uh, surprised one of the way but but uh but i think the most important way was how uh people were going to uh deal with the overt unfairness of uh, Keyforge in that some decks are better than others. Um, and there was a lot of sort of misinformation at the beginning, which uh, were was spread by well-meaning fans where they were sort of, uh, you know, people would say they, they claim they were balanced uh, using some super algorithm or something like that. Uh, or, or you know, this might be before they intent. You know, they they saw the game, uh, uh, but they might have you know played a play test or talked to a play tester or something like that. Um, and I had to keep on saying, no, no, these decks are definitely not balanced. Um, that's not 
what this game is about. Um, and I know that that this can provide an excellent game experience, but it is very much against uh, current game culture. And uh, and so in the design, I really had to refamiliarize myself with uh, that uh, as we were going through it, because I've, I've sort of been so indoctrinated into the standards of our, our current uh, golden age of games. But uh, I remembered, uh, for example, in uh, when I was in high school and, uh, and college, playing games that were just unfair. And they didn't bother me in the slightest. Uh, there was one side which was worse than the other. And, uh, and the thing was, when you played that side, it, it was exhilarating. You know, maybe I'd lose more often, but, you know, it was more of a challenge. And uh, and uh, um, and I liked that being a part of the game. And it, in fact, uh, I liked it so much that I made this. Uh, 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 you might be familiar with uh, the, the game. Uh, I think it's usually called Assassin uh, that takes place often on college campuses where you're hunting down one particular person. And when you uh, shoot them with your dart gun, then you uh, collect their target and uh um, and then you shoot the next person, and, and, and this might be played over days or weeks or months. Uh, I made my own uh, version of that where there was just like you know, 10 people hunting one or two people. Um, that was not a fair competition, but it was a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, and, and so, but then seeing how people uh, uh, engaged with Keyforge was uh, was very interesting because some people were all about trying to balance the decks or finding balanced decks. Other people were uh, about trying to find the best decks and beating people with it, which I think is you know, sort of a poisonous way to approach this game. Um, and uh, and uh, other people were uh, more like I engage with it, where if you have a good deck in the play group. Uh, that becomes something people want to play against, not with, because, I mean, it's similar to playing a, a computer game on a difficult setting. You don't always want to sit down and play it on the easiest setting, which is analogous to playing with the best deck. Mm, it's a benchmark. It's a benchmark. And and just a, a super quick follow-up to that. Were the idea of chains um, created as a way in which to rein in some of those disparities between deck power levels certainly that is our kind of de facto balancing mechanic between decks yes yeah um from the start i knew i wanted to have a handicapping system in the game to uh, so that players could balance their decks um and uh i i i did not see I know a lot of people uh, when they first heard about it, and uh, and and you know probably still today, would like some sort of global chain system which globally balances the decks. I just that that never seemed to me f- to be feasible. Uh, but uh, um, but for people taking ownership of their own play experience and uh, making a fair game out of uh, out of uh, components which may not be fair. Um, it works. It works as intended, uh, uh, and I knew in, in in a similar way to the fact that I knew that uh, there might be some difficulty. There would be some difficulties with people accepting a uh, overtly unbalanced game. Uh, I also know handicaps are similarly uh, um, not embraced by the game community, um, which is that I understand a little less because uh, handicaps. Uh, in, in, in a game where handicaps are, you get a lot of good play out of a game where, where handicaps are embraced by the players. Uh, Go is a, 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 you know, the, the premier example, of course, but, uh, but uh, I have a lot more fun playing squash when, uh, when, when we're playing with handicaps uh, than without. And, uh, and it, it just, you know, it's like at, at first I was resistant to playing with a handicap because I didn't want to take a handicap and then win the game and feel like I only won because of the handicap. But, you know, it, it, it was very, very quickly I lost that feeling because it just made it the game uh, sort of challenging for both players. And uh, if I took a handicap, and ended up winning or losing, uh, it, it, the, the whole experience was much more satisfying because I saw that my opponent, even though they were better than me, they had to work. And it was pretty depressing to play 
without the handicaps and they would beat me by, you know, they would beat me every time. And if I uh, almost beat them or beat them, uh, uh, you know, it's like, it felt like they were just slacking off. Uh, uh, so, so I'm a big fan of handicaps is uh, what this comes down to. And, and so, and, 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 and this seemed like a natural place to apply them. Yeah. I remember the, some of the basics in one of the, the Keyforge rulebook talking about giving a, a standard place to start where uh, in a particular matchup of two decks, if one continues to win for every X number of wins, give it, you know, X number of chains uh, as kind of an entry point into into that uh, balancing there to to make both p- uh, pilots and both decks uh, work yeah. for it. In that yeah, yeah, sense, yeah, certainly. Um, yeah. And and, and uh, um, I. Uh, encouraged people to uh once once they had a reasonable you know they were in the ballpark uh not to adjust every time they play but to adjust uh based on two out of three which is uh, pretty standard for other games that's what i do for squash for example um and the it's it's very uh tempting after you lose two in a row to want to adjust the handicap but uh, one has to keep in mind that if you've got a fair handicap, you're going to lose two in a row uh, 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 25% of the time. And, uh, and, and, uh, and one of the decks is going to lose two in the row 50% of the time. So half the time you're going to get false positives if you adjust based on just two losses or two wins. Um, and uh, so, so making it so that you have to lose three in a row uh, you could still get unlucky and adjust the wrong way, but it makes it much less likely, and it makes it so that that third game uh, is very exciting because you're actually playing for stakes, uh, an adjustment of the, uh, the the handicap. And I think I think something that's a a triumph of Keyforge's unfairness is that it's not uniform. Like if a deck is very good, that doesn't mean it is very good against every other deck typically i'm sure people are still out there looking for that deck right um but i think we've found especially um over the past year in keyforge the people who are playing it very seriously have really landed on this phrase that keyforge is a game of matchups and you may have a deck that is uh it is very strong but there is there are several medium strength decks out there that have the silver bullet against that particular deck that take it down uh without breaking too much of a sweat so i think that really helps and helps people to enjoy that unfairness uh, when the matchups uh, between uh, between the decks are so important. Especially as more and more sets come out, we get more and more flavors of rock paper scissors in that way, which is just oh, an absolute yep. delight. Yeah, thanks. That, that was something certainly I wanted to see in the game and was happy to happy to get in. Uh, um, and 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 another thing was the uh, power of the pilot is very high on many of the decks. That is, you can uh, really seriously misplay them uh, and really play them uh, much, much better. Uh, and it's not the same for every deck, uh, which uh, for me was critical because because um, one of the things I really wanted to see was players becoming the best in the world at their particular deck, uh, the one they happen to be playing. Oh, yes. Uh, I know so many people in the community have had that experience diving into, uh, you know, one deck um, and really getting to know it. And there's quite a number of people in the community who have stories with a deck that's so unique to them. Uh, Our previous two episodes where there were a gentleman named George Cagle who won two different vault tours uh, with the same deck. And so he has got quite the story with uh, Gasoline Maximiliano. Um, (laughs) And then uh, we have... Uh, some friends who stream Keyforge, they live together, so they're able to stream it during the pandemic, uh, Tabletop Royale, and they have set up a system where they have a, a literal belt, like a wrestling belt, that a deck has, and it defends its title against uh, newcomers that the uh, that the community gets to pick. So they've actually gamified uh, that challenge to take down the top deck, which uh, I, th- I think you may find find absolutely delightful. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's uh, I, I really enjoy it when... Uh... Uh, people take ownership of their game experience in that way because there's so many different ways you can do that with, with really any game, but uh, but but a, a game like KeyForge, uh, uh, there's 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 just a, an immense amount you can do uh, with uh, sort of league or uh, uh, game structures uh, around your playgroup. 
Yeah, certainly. Um, on that topic, uh, Richard, are there any decks that you've opened yourself that you have a particular affinity for? Uh, well, um, uh, I, I've I've opened many decks that had uh, um, interesting combos that I liked, but but usually the thing which I respond to uh, most is the name. Um, uh, the 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 name mm. algorithm uh, was honestly it was probably as much fun to work on as uh, the game design. Uh, and it, it just, there were so many different unexpected names that came out of it uh, that, uh, um, that uh, f- you know, finding a, a, a surprising, funny, appropriate name was, uh, was, was just a lot of fun for me. Yes. Uh, I, I, I know the mathematically, this is insanely unlikely. I assume you haven't found King potato. No, yet. no, I have not. Uh, um, uh, I, I, I occasionally look on uh, the uh, the registry to see what's you know what's out there, uh, and uh, am am uh, uh, take do take pleasure in finding uh, fun names that are out there. Although the odds of me opening it up are uh, very low. But uh, uh, for instance, my my son uh, uh, Skyler, uh, who who was a uh, um, a very the best player in the world at one point uh, before it was released. Um, <laughs> uh, he, he was he was quite good. He was he, uh, it was it was surprising to me that he was uh, that he yeah that he was better than me uh, during design. Um, uh, he anyway his name is Skyler, so I occasionally look up his name among all my uh, other family name, and uh, I found the supposedly supposedly well read Skyler, and I thought that was a, a, a pretty amazing name. <laughs> Brilliant name that is. Oh, I think I'm still looking for a name that that really suits me down down to the core, but um, I will carry on that search, and that is that is part of part of the fun of it. Uh, I I did have a listener send me a deck with my surname in it, which was which was a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, I know it, it's 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 uh, yeah, it, it's it's been a lot of fun. In fact, I I I don't know if this was, I mean, this is probably an, uh, published, so uh, you you probably know this, but I I named the uh, deck algorithm Celine uh, and that and so we would always when I was talking to uh, the the fantasy flight guys I would refer to uh, what I was doing with uh, uh, Celine and what we were uh, what sort of names we were working on at the time but Celine stood for a stochastic exotic list exploiting uh, name engine and uh, um, oh, yeah love and, a good and acronym. it was a, <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, it, 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 it one of the reasons it was uh, would surprise me is because uh, um, I would do things like uh, take large lists of words and just dump them in without even you know checking them. For instance, with the uh, uh, with the Brobnar, uh names, I dropped in. Uh, I, I don't know. It must have been over a thousand uh, 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 Viking names. Uh, and, uh, and and so put them in so that they would be uh, randomly shuffled in, but then it would also take them, split them in two, combine them together, and drop out sort of hybrid names uh, from those. So you'd get Viking names and Viking-ish names. Um, but then you would be, you know, uh, this, of course, was just a formula for getting uh, getting uh, surprised and getting terrible names. Uh, because, uh, one of the houses that I was working on at the time was... Uh, gnomes which uh, uh uh they they had uh it was gnomes and they had robots they would build these robots it was called the tinker house uh which got replaced with mars eventually um and uh and so for the tinker house i i, I decided to give them uh pet names so i took in you know 2000 pet names and dropped them in and uh yeah, uh, I know there was a, a bit of a kerfluffle about uh, about some of the names under the original production being uh, being inappropriate and banned. It was nothing like some of the some of them came from mixing and matching pet names. There, are, some people uh, really don't give their pets very nice names. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, Richard, you've spoken a lot about how. Keyforge was different to design than really everything that came before. But what were some of the biggest lessons that you as a designer learned through going through that process with Keyforge? Uh, well, it really, uh, it put me 
back in touch with this uh, this idea that um, fairness in a game um, shouldn't be uh, put on a pedestal. Um, that there's uh, lots of game opportunity uh, just from things being unfair, uh, and uh, and and I, I was sort of all aware of that at some level, but it really uh, drove it home for me uh, because so many of the experiences that I had in play and play test, you just couldn't get with you know a more finely balanced game, and uh, um, it's it's made me uh, as as a game player and designer um, realize I'm looking at games in general differently now. Uh, to illustrate that, um, I, I was listening to a, uh, uh, a game review of the game uh, Tapestry uh, last year. Uh, I think it was uh, uh, Tom Vassell. And he mentioned that he wasn't sure, that, you know, that some people didn't think it was balanced and he wasn't sure it was balanced. And I was surprised to realize that that excited me. It didn't turn me away. Um, and I explored that thought more. And I realized that, uh, that, uh, that if it had been presented as being a very uh, honed and balanced experience, which many of, the game, you know, many of the games these days are, or at least are trying to be, um, often what that means is that a lot of the very fun things that were there originally have been taken away. Uh, so you play these games that are, are, are super well balanced, which, you know, don't get me wrong, I, I often love them. I like, uh, like uh, balanced games uh, as much as uh, the next person. Um, but, but there are often some very fun uh, things which people do in exploring the, uh, the rougher prototypes, and they get honed away, honed away, honed away until you've got this game that is, is this very specific experience for people who... Uh, are very experienced with the game, and uh, um, and and the first time player, everything sort of seems like the same move because everything's so uh, uh, so checked and balanced, um, and it takes really becoming good at the game before you begin to appreciate what that game's about. Anyway, uh, so so that that is one of the things which really came to the forefront uh, with Keyforge is I really began to appreciate that. Uh, more overtly, and I found that uh, it, it's become a measuring stick I, I put up against uh, other games now. I really sort of look for a, a, a good example of a game which uh, is unbalanced and super fun is uh, that I, that I, uh, is uh, Innovation. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the card game Innovation, uh, but uh, Carl Chuddick, who's done a bunch of games that I like, and this was, you know, from it's probably uh, 15 or 20 years old. Um, but but when you play it, it's like there's just so much craziness going on in the game, so many different combos, so many different ways to play it. If you and, and, and you can just lose by you know making a stupid mistake or your opponent getting a lucky lucky draw, but there's ways to play against that. There's just a, 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 a it's a very rich and large uh, 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 a, a rich area to explore for the player, which does which I think, in another player's hand might have become something uh, much more focused on uh, just sort of top level play where everything is uh, is is you know much more uh, precisely balanced against everything else fascinating fascinating yeah and as you're saying this i'm thinking to myself that keyforge would probably lose a lot of its personality uh, if you took away those big bold crazy wacky goofy effects that Keyforge has that is maybe one of those differentiators for Keyforge because we're not seeing that in some of those games that are going for balance over over that controlled chaos I suppose that that Keyforge uh, Keyforge players know and love and I, I'm interested in in uh, in exploring something connected to this over you know, you've spoken a bit about what players value and the kind of trends in 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 the gamer space and in in the gaming community. Um, what do you hope that Keyforge teaches people as a game um, or as an experience beyond the game? Well, uh, certainly uh, hitting the same note again and again. I, you know, it's like if 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 uh, 
player, well, if players uh, can uh, embrace uh, unfair game games like Keyforge, games where where the components are so differently powered, and take it upon themselves to make it a a, a fun experience, either by balancing the decks or by play, you know, with with uh, with handicaps or playing again, you know, in a format which balances it to their satisfaction, or you know, playing, uh, you know, just uh, enjoying playing uh, sometimes unbalanced games. Uh, then, 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 then I think uh, uh, th- I think there's a lot of game design and game play that is unexplored these days. There, I think that uh, a, a lot of the promise of trading card games um, is not uh, realized with trading card games because when people are given the ability to make the decks, it takes away uh, it takes away a lot it can take away a lot of the variety which you you crave in such a, a game format. Uh, like magic promises infinite variety, and if you play a draft or a league, it, it has that really. Um, but but if you play constructed, uh, which is what a lot of people like to play, it it sort of has a lot of variety to some players. But there, but but if you want to play uh, well, you often have to bow to the orthodox, which is uh, whatever you know people say are the the, the best decks and you can vary those but but you'll there there are a lot of cards and a lot of variety you'll never see in the environment and it's that loss uh of of enjoyable play space which i would like to see in a game like keyforge and really in a lot of other game designs um just to elaborate on that a little more um uh one of the most exciting things for me with Keyforge has been this idea that uh, people have a very difficult time telling other people what the best way to play is, and 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 uh, and that is for me uh, uh, has what well, I love game analysis and I, I, you know, I read books on poker and chess and you know all, plenty of games which I don't even play because I like to see what people how people break down games and think about them it's very enjoyable to me but at the same time I find the uh, that culture often poisonous to people who want to play games and explore them uh, because there's this way which they're told they have to play and if they don't play that way well they're going up against a lot of people who do play that way and even if they're it isn't necessarily the best way they know how to play it best because they've read these guides on how to do it this way the experts have analyzed the game and it's ridiculous how fast sometimes people come out with these orthodox ways to play Um, by making it so that players have unique assets in the game I think you can uh, you can still have this idea of uh, analysis of the game being a part of the game, but it sort of takes a more meta uh, seat where you have to take into account not everybody has the same stuff. And I would like to see that reflected in uh, in really a lot of different game areas. Uh, I've been thinking digitally recently, but uh, but like you can imagine, say, a game like Diablo. Uh, uh, in Diablo, your uh, there are builds which people say, at least Diablo uh, 2, Diablo 3, well, it's the same thing, but uh, um, there are builds you're supposed to do, and there's uh, um, equipment you're supposed to get, and and really people strive to get these most powerful warriors in that area. But if, but if you reimagined a game like Diablo where everybody's getting something unique and they're working with that thing, it becomes a very different thing. You would be, you know, you'll be reading guides not on this is the skill you should take at this level and you should find this sort of equipment to put here. Uh, you would be reading, to me, much more interesting and open-ended things which allowed uh, a, play, a player's own artistry and uh, gameplay to be incorporated in, in, in uh, uh, figuring out the best way to play. Yeah, and I, I have to say that Keyforge in my opinion, really has accomplished that at least to some degree because 
we see at you know these people who are traveling to vault tours uh you see people who are very good at the game and they place well on a fairly regular basis uh and so there is an indicator that you know their skill is certainly present there however uh yeah there is not a definitive a definitive guide to this is how you play a keyforge deck best because one of the unique deck aspect um and two just people haven't solved the game yet there was a an, an instance in a tournament where a a person had a mass mutation deck with a very unique set of enhancements. All the draw pips were on, you know, one card. And then he had a card that let him do something when there were draw pips on a particular, you know, on a card. And um, he just blew the tournament out of the water by doing this combo that was literally only possible with his deck. So uh, I think uh, I think that is accomplished. Uh, at least the, the very first iteration it has been accomplished with Keyforge, I would say. Yeah, you know, it's always exciting to hear uh, stories like that. Uh, uh, I've, I've always uh, one one of the things with uh, magic. I remember in the I really liked designing cards that I didn't know how, which I did not know how players were going to use. And as far as I know, there was no use for them at all. Uh, they just did something weird, and. Uh, um, and, and, and that's because I really liked giving people tools uh, without uh, without having an idea, without having a preconception of how they are supposed to pursue those using those tools. Um, and, uh, and 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 because of the way trading card games were constructed, environments in particular. Uh, um, uh, that that happens less often than I would like with those environments, but with a game like Keyforge, uh, it's 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 sort of in it's boil it's it's uh, baked into the design. Uh, you get this deck, you know, it's like uh, there's just a bunch of tools, and you got to figure out how best to use it. Of course. Um, so for our our final question here, Richard, we really appreciated uh, having you here today. Um, just looking uh, towards the future. Um, we're, we're very hopeful for the, the future of the game. You know, it was initially even a huge commercial success and we're, we're really looking forward to after um, as things become more safe and people are playing out in person again. Uh, what excites you the most about the future of Keyforge? Two things, uh, I guess, uh, come to mind. Um, one is uh, some sort of digital implementation. Uh, uh, the game was designed with digital Im- implementation in mind uh it was never uh I, I i believe you can have such a thing and have a robust uh face-to-face environment um uh and that the face-to-face is never going to be replaced by digital play but uh um but that they will enhance one another and uh that it's sort of a shame it didn't get implemented earlier and now of course uh the way way things have worked out with this pandemic it it is you know sort of more important than ever um so that, that that's certainly the first thing that uh that i would like to uh see um and then the other thing is uh um there's uh, as we've hit, hit a couple times in this uh podcast there's a lot of different ways people can engage with uh a game like keyforge and seeing uh uh both some of the ones that we've thought of enjoyed by players and some of the ones that players inevitably will come up with uh surprising me and being enjoyed by players uh is is wonderful um and uh and so both those things uh i'm sort of fascinated by you know the possibilities of new mechanics and different things we can do here because i think we've only uh, sort of scratched the card design uh surface but both of those are dwarfed by uh how you can play with the deck and possibly playing it digitally, which are these are both in, in, in some ways two two sides of the same coin. Uh, but uh, uh, for for example, um, one method of play which uh, I particularly like the sound of, and I, I don't actually know if it's been played outside of playtest this way. Uh, although I know it's been published, so you've probably you know, there's a good chance you've uh, read a description of it. But uh, but but one very interesting way to play is to, is, is is a league structure where um, one uh, group of players, say twenty players, gets say twelve decks, and uh, another group gets twelve decks, and then in 
you know, two or three weeks' time, they have a tournament with the top three decks from both those groups. Uh, and this very simple idea, but when, but 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 when you actually think about how this will be played, it, I find it very exciting because it all these 12 people, they're not all going to play, all, uh, all these sort of uh, 20 people or whatever it is, are not all, are not going to end up playing, but they can all be usefully implemented in play testing the decks, trying to figure out who's the best at playing the decks, the best ways to play the decks, and ranking them. And there's a lot of people who uh, uh, engage in a game like this who don't actually want to uh, have the stress of playing in a tournament, um, but they still enjoy participating in this way, and they have a lot to bring in thinking about how how you should go about strategizing, so to speak. And so it's almost like you've got this pit crew and you've got these uh, these people who are going to go out and pilot it, but they're all important. And, and so that's that's just an example of one of the ways to play, which I think is pretty exciting. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, there's you know, probably uh, dozens or, uh, you know, even hundreds of ways uh, uh, to, to put things together that uh, would, would probably be equally interesting to me. But the... Uh, but that's that's an example of one. Sure, sure. Yeah, I love that idea of a league with just different roles for people who enjoy the game differently. I think with content creators in Keyforge, uh, I know a large number of people of you know myself and Ed among them who we love to create content or maintain and improve the the wiki uh, or all these other things. Even if we're not particularly competitive uh, or haven't had competitive success at the very least. <laughs> uh <-huh>. uh <laughs> But there are all these spaces to contribute in that way. And I think uh, exploring a league like that, what you suggested, where you've got space for these managers and these strategizers, and then you figure out who the pilot will be because they're, they're, they maybe intuitively understand that kind of deck. That is a, a lovely idea that continues to dive into the uniqueness of Keyforge and focuses on the people playing Keyforge too. That's really, that's really great. But I did actually uh, bring up uh, Celine. Uh, and uh, dusted her off and got her running again. And uh, it's got in it uh, um, a bunch of uh, the names which I highlighted that I really like from Playtest. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, I could read you some of them. And uh, um, again, these these may not have uh, make make it into the made have, they may not have made it into the final uh, version which uh, Fantasy Flight put together. But uh, these are some of the names which uh, which I liked. Let's see, uh, Justice Ratstaff. Uh, uh, she who grates upon professors, uh, Vega No Thumbs. I thought that was a pretty good one. Uh, and uh, let's see. Uh, oh, this one. I really like this one. Uh, Eagle Mouseworm. Uh, <laughs> Eagle is the first name, and Mouseworm is a is a uh, a, a, a last name. Uh, and uh, uh, let's see. She that bakes. For the bottom of mathematics, uh, <laughs> excellent. And uh, oh, vexing mun vexing munch jelly, uh, <laughs> fabulous. Uh, mouse finger Gomez, mm. uh, mm. and uh, uh, and uh, well, let's finish on one more. What do we got? Uh, oh, the annoying town idiot. Yeah, that, oh yes, <laughs> Zach, there's a deck for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's go find that one. Awesome. Well, uh, Richard, thank you so much for coming on Call of Discovery today. It was an absolute joy to have you, uh, and we really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, so, yeah, thank you so much for uh, giving your time and and having a, a great conversation with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, it's been a lot of fun talking about keyboards. Thank you. <laughs> yes, we think so too. We think so too. If you're enjoying Call of Discovery, please make sure to subscribe on your preferred podcast app and leave us a rating. It helps immensely for Keyforge players new and old to find us. On that note, if you are new to Keyforge, please visit the new player guide we've linked below on Archon Arcana, the Keyforge wiki. You'll find answers to questions and a myriad of helpful resources to get you started on your own unique journey into Richard's wonderful game. If you are a listener looking to support us monetarily, please visit our Patreon linked below where you can sign up to support us monthly at your preferred level and view rewards for our patrons like our exclusive Discord. Let us also know what you'd like to see more or less of in future shows by interacting with us across social media on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, or you can even send us an email at podcast at callofdiscovery.com. 
But most importantly, if you think a friend would enjoy this podcast, please help them to discover it. Have you answered the call of discovery? 